Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ died to sin once for all, and now he lives to God. Let us renew our resolve to have done with all that is evil and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. 
he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham! Abraham! Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place The Lord will provide, and to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. Some people really hate the Bible. The atheist Richard Dawkins is amongst them. Writing about our Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 22, he says this, God ordered Abraham to make a burnt offering of his long-for son. Abraham built an altar, put firewood upon it, trussed up Isaac on top of the wood. His murdering knife was already in hand when an angel dramatically intervened with the news of a last-minute change of plan. God was only joking after all, tempting Abraham, testing his faith. This disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse, bullying in two unequal power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defence, I was only obeying orders. Well, Christians would entirely disagree with Dawkins' statement. Uh, We'll see why in a few moments. But there still remains this question of why God commands a child sacrifice, something more associated with paganism than the worship of the one true God. So what's all this about? Well, before we attempt to answer that question, we need to remind ourselves of the background. By the time we arrive at Genesis chapter 22, Abraham has been on a bit of a roller coaster journey. Over a quarter of a century has passed since God had promised an elderly couple a son, and at long last he'd arrived to the utter joy of his parents and no doubt the astonishment of his neighbours. So it was true after all, God is a God of his word, or so it seemed. What else was there to do but to retire, to sit back, to enjoy what life there was left? Abraham was surely a rich man by now, a man of influence and standing. It was now up to his son Isaac to kind of take up the baton of faith. It's the next generation's turn. Abraham has done his bit for the cause. And that's often the way it seems, isn't it? We have our battles. We know of life's ups and downs. What more can there be? And then we're hit 
with the sometime later of verse one, quite unexpectedly, totally out of the blue, we're in a situation which is our worst nightmare, almost invariably has something to do with someone we love. And in chapter 22, verse one, we read that God tested Abraham. Now, that statement is put there for our sake to show that God does not act on a whim, but with a purpose. We're given that privileged information, but no such explanation is offered to Abraham. He's left totally in the dark. Take your son, whom you love, to the region of Mount Moriah, which means the Mount of Vision. And then comes the blood curdling words that must have caused Abraham's heart to leap in his throat. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountains. I will show you. Abraham knew exactly what that burnt sacrifice would involve in all its gory detail, binding his son with a rope, killing him with a knife, burning his body on some wood his son. And this is the God Abraham had declared to be the God of the earth who will do what is right. Abraham must have had his questions. What of the promises? What of the boy? What of his poor mother? What of the heartbreak? You could well imagine him thinking, anything Lord but this, why not take my life instead? Now you have to admit there does seem to be an inconsistency. God promises life one minute only to take it away the next. Just how can you be expected to trust a God like that? But isn't that precisely what we're expected to do, to trust the God who perplexes? us? We might also ask what sort of man would be willing to do this? Abraham's not a callous man. He's not a stupid man who exercises what some would call blind faith, a sort of leap in the dark. If you see, all of this comes some time later. For over 30 years now, Abraham has walked with this God. And at every moment along the journey, even when Abraham has failed, God has kept faithful. Why should God suddenly change now? Crucially, this testing comes as the climax to a life of testing and trust. Although Abraham does not know why he is to do this, at least he knows why he trusts God. Who knows why? It is because of walking in the light with God during the good times that he can trust him when he's asked to go into this dark time. And so we turn in verses three to 10 to the man who obeys. The first thing we notice about this obedience is that it is immediate. Verse three, early next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. No excuses, he simply gets on with it. That, and that's what God expects and he's not disappointed. But that doesn't mean it was easy. I'm sure that Abraham wrestled in agony for three long days of what he must do to his son. We're told in verse four, he looked up then and he saw the place in the distance. So there it was at last, the killing ground, the place of slaughter. But to however painful, however taxing, Abraham's obedience is total, there's no drawing back. The servants are kept away from the mountain and, and Abraham tells them that he and Isaac are going to worship and then return. Now, why did he say that? Maybe there is the hope that God will provide a way out Abraham's uh, going to do nothing but totally trust in the character and the promises of God, despite the circumstances that he was facing. And isn't that the, often the way for us? We can't understand why a tragedy is struck, uh, or why the burnout is coming our way, but we'll keep on trusting nonetheless. And so we follow these two lonely and pathetic figures as they slowly make their way up the steep, uh, cold mountainside, stumbling over the hard slabs of rock. The wood, the means of the son's destruction, is placed on his shoulders. He carries the instrument of his own death and the knife is held in the frail hand of his father together as they walk on in silence. But then the son speaks into the silence, an innocent question. Where is the lamb for the bird's offering? And Abraham answers, God himself will provide the lamb. What was that? A hope, a prayer, a prophecy, maybe a combination of the three. Then we come to the agonizing climax. Abraham finds a clearing. He begins to pile one huge stone upon another. Then the wood is carefully stacked on the altar to ensure maximum incineration when ignited. And Isaac, without argument, but not without fear, lies down on the freezing cold rock, holding out his arms and legs to be bound there, no escape. Through tear-filled eyes, his father slowly approaches his son. His trembling hand reaches for the knife. He lifts it from the ground, its razor sharp, blade glinting in the sunlight his arms make a sweeping motion in an arc and then without a moment to spare the piercing cry of the angel freezes Abraham in an instant 
it's all over, the test complete. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now, if the story was to end there, we might feel that there is a sense of relief, but not a satisfactory ending. Then Dawkins would appear to be correct. It would seem that God is nothing but a heartless tyrant playing on our emotions, satisfying some morbid curiosity on his part about the state of our faith. No, the true climax of this story is that it leads to the Lord who provides, verses 13 to 19. The fact is, contact with the true God requires sacrifice. Sin is serious and blood has to be spilt. Worship costs and it is God who provides the ram. Nonetheless, true worship, which means humble, heartfelt obedience, pays. God now un underpins his promises with an oath. He swears by himself as there is no one higher by which to swear. And the promises are elaborated even further. Not only will Abraham's descendants be like the stars in the heavens, but more numerous than the grains of sand on the seashore. If you can count all of the, those, Abraham, then you'll know how many are going to come from this child that you were willing to give up. And how have these promises been fulfilled? How have these billions of spiritual descendants of Abraham come about? Well, because of what took place on this same mountain some 2000 years ago, involving yet another son and a father. You see, this is Mount Moriah, the place where the temple was to be built, where God provided the means of forgiveness of sins for his people with the sacrifice of animals. But this was the region, but a stone's throw away from another place where a father took his son, his only son, whom he loved, and placed him on the wood he was to carry to his death. Up he went, wearied and blooded, to the appointed place of execution, where he was willingly bound and hoisted up on the altar of a cross. But this time there was no cry from heaven, only silence, no stay of execution. The blood flowed and the father's heart was broken. Why? So that the sin so offensive to God and so destructive to us could be dealt with. Jesus, the judge, was judged in our place. You see, right here at the beginning of the Bible, we are given a glimpse of what God would do and must do if we're to have a relationship with him. Forgiveness is not cheap, it costs. True worship costs. It is so easy for us to come into uh, this building or to come onto the computer uh, and take a part in a service remotely, that we fail to realise the enormous cost of having a relationship with God, the cost of Jesus' death for us. That is the focus of our communion service. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Just as the ram caught in the thicket was Isaac's substitute, so Jesus is our substitute dying in our place. A life is given for a life, his for yours and mine. This is what the cross is all about. It is the father and the son together who have agreed on this course of action as being the only course of action to reconcile a sinful world. It cost the father as much as it did the son, as it was costing Abraham as well as Isaac. If you think it was hard for Abraham to do this to his son, do you think for a moment it was any less hard for God? Your rescue and mine cost God dearly. Our response is to be that of Abraham and to serve him totally. Let's pray together. Lord, as we consider uh, the costly response of Abraham to take his only son and to be willing to uh, kill him on that mountain and all that he must have gone through, we recognise that you are the one who went that point further and sacrifice your only son for us so that we might be clean. And Lord, as we reflect on your death for us once again, and Lord, as we reflect on your death for us, help us to follow, help us to respond in faith to you. Help us to uh, cling to that cross ourselves. Help us to be grateful for all that you have done for us, for we ask this in your name.
Amen. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I wondered at your gift of life. I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. Again, I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. Now you are exalted to the highest place. Of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at your saving grace. I'm full of praise once again. I'm full of praise once again. And once again, I look upon the cross where you died. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. And we just have a moment's silence as we're referring before God anything we particularly wish to pray for.
We ask all of these things in the name and for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we join in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.